Hey guys, my name is Jason with Mount Baker Mining and Metals. And on today's video, I have a really exciting one for you. I got Dan Hurd coming down. I've got his samples from a previous video we took. So we're going to be processing through the jaw crusher, hammer mill, and the shaker table to see how much gold he has in the samples. And I'm going to do something a little bit different on this one. For those of you who have seen part one or you want to skip ahead and go right into the ore processing, I'm going to leave a timestamp right up here so you can skip ahead. For those of you new to the channel or may want to review what we did on our first part, I'm going to put that right after this shot so you can start at the very beginning. Hey guys, my name is Jason with Mount Baker Mining and Metals. And on today's video, I'm here with Dan Hurd at one of his mines. Well, hello everyone. Dan Hurd with Dan Hurd Prospecting here. We're here at the Midway Mine. Jason from Mount Baker Mining has uh, offered to help me out doing some assays, some testing of the gold ore at this mine. So we are taking some samples today to check out how rich this mine could actually be and maybe even doing a little exploring in there. Well, there goes Dan up the hill. And we're going up to these workings over here to check out what he's got going on. We're hoping to get about a hundred, uh, maybe up to 200 kilogram sample today that I can take back across the border into the States, run through my turnkey system, and we'll do a little mill analysis, sample analysis for him. See how much gold he's got in his rocks. All right, Dan, so we're here at your mine. Tell us a little bit about what we got here and what we're looking at. Well, the portal has been blocked off for safety reasons, but the main seam is right here. There's actually two of them, one here, one just over there. And uh, they are rotted out sulfide seams for sure. And uh, the pit that we'll be working today is actually up on top and over there. But okay. We got, to, we got to check out the added anyways. Yeah, let's, yeah, we'll get underground today. But uh, our main goal is to get on top in the pit up here over the little ridge, get a sample, and we're going to take it back to my shop in Washington State, run it through my process, and see how much gold Dan has in his ore. Yeah, the old time miner said that what we're looking for here is the rusty decomposed stuff and that that's got the best gold content in it. And now this is just the mine dump, but there are a few pieces of, there's, there's a good chunk right there. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is kind of the stuff we're looking for. The go Gossen? Goss yeah, Gossen, I Gossen think I've heard it called. Is what, they, what they're calling it. Just basically the sulfides have rotted out a bit already, just leaving a bit of the, you know, silicates left holding the rock together. Yeah. And that's what they said is that's where they were getting the best content. See the pirates right there. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. And we're just looking for that mineralization, <clears throat> that uh, decomposed stuff. Any pyrites are a good sign. Yeah, and what we will find, maybe not in the dump here, we will find full rocks of uh, sulfides, pyrites. Oh really? Yeah, like okay. You'll pick them up and you'll know instantly. It, just by the weight, huh? Okay, very cool. Well, yeah, let's get up there and we'll see what we can find. Now there's a great little story here I got from one of the old time miners that mined this back in the early 80s. Uh, I met him, he was just up here hunting and he told me the whole story of this mine. He said that they did a lot of work here back in the 80s. They drilled, they sampled, they assayed. There's three levels to this mine. This is the top one, it goes down two more. And he said the assay results were almost the same in all three levels. They mined a bit here, they mined a bit at the second level and then they mined a lot down at the bottom. They sent away the bottom to the smelters to get the gold out of it. And the smelters came back and said, sorry, you got no gold. Now the miner said he doesn't know if it was, you know, a bad assay, a bad smelt, if someone was lying somewhere along the way, whatever. But they went into big debt to get that big ore sample from down below, sent off, smelted, and they got nothing back for it. So to get themselves out of debt, they went back to the top level, this one actually even above it, uh, back to the top level, dug a small pit where they knew there was good gold, and they sent that away, got the gold out of it, and paid off their debts. So the top pit, which I know exactly where it is, obviously has really good gold. That's what we're sampling today. Let's go up there. We are heading up this old dump pile headed up to the upper pit where the old timers had some good luck with some high grade gold. So we're gonna go up and see what we can find today. And we're just about to get our first view 
of the honey hole. The honey hole, yes. And you can see the two seams coming into the hole. One, two, very easily. One of them going oh, out. Interesting. The second one goes out over here somewhere. Okay. And obviously, that's what they dug to get themselves out of debt. That's the zone. This is. That's not much for. That's it, not much material. It, yeah, it's not a very big hole. It's no. not a very. I mean, there there wasn't, you know, a hundred dump trucks come out of here by any means. This was, this was a small, little. It's almost like a prospect pit, but this is what they used to pay off their smelter debt. Yeah. Wow. Well, that is interesting. I'm I'm kind of fascinated by the geology here too, with the two parallel veins. I would thought they would have come together, but it looks like they're actually di diverging some, yep. going to the east, and maybe coming together going to the west. A um, geologist friend that's coming up here that works with uh, the big mining company, he's actually coming up later on today to actually map this, where it goes on the surface, both directions. Uh -huh. He's going to map the, the dip, the strike, everything of this, well, these veins. And the, the, this is the, the only vein on the property that you know of? Is this one? No. There's, oh, there, there, there's veins all over the place. Oh, this, really? This just happens to be the richest. Oh, okay, okay. So this isn't just a one and done thing. There's there's lots of targets. Yeah, this is the same property as my Ocean Picture Stone claim. And in fact, it might even be the same seam. It's just over there, the quartz has turned blue for whatever reason. Oh, interesting. Over here, the quartz is hosting gold. Wow, interesting. Okay. Well, and there's a teaser for another video, the Ocean Picture Stone video. We'll go there tomorrow. Okay, awesome. We're going down into the pit here, and we are going to categorize this into two different samples. This is going to be the north vein, and we'll take a bag from this side of the pit and a bag from the opposite side of the pit. That'll be the north vein, and then we have the south vein over by me here. Again, we'll do the same thing. We'll take a bag from here, a bag from the other side of the pit over there, and we will sample them both separately. Jason was just saying, on a vein like this, it's important for uh, overall sample to take from one side to the other so that we can get sort of the cross section of everything and we're not just taking a high grade sample and skewing our results. So let's get going. Let's break some rock. Oh yeah. Uh, Dan, it is up to you where you want to start. I would call this the hanging wall and this the foot wall. It looks like it dips to the north maybe a little bit. Do you want to start here? Do you want to start here? I would get closer to, yeah, just because of what those old timers said, it was all in the rotting material. Sure, yeah. So let's just stick with sort of the rotting and then just, you know. From here to somewhere yeah. in here, wherever the, the easy break is. Yep. And we'll just get a bucket set up here. Let's move their flag. And I'm just going to start right here on this hanging wall. I'm just going to work my way across. And it is human nature to take the easiest stuff, but it's really it's really important that you get a, a full cross section width. Now, I'm just, I, that was a little example of, I tried to take equal amounts all the way across. Now I'm gonna just work up and down until I can get a bucket full, and that'll be our sample from this side. It's nice when it's all soft and easy. I've been in some quartz veins where they're <laughs> hard as the hubs of hell and they just, it's Bre really hard. Breaking chisels trying to break it. Yeah, that's right, whereas this stuff is nice. You've really broken into a section here. It looks like it may have some unrotted sulfides in it. Mm -hmm. I saw some shinies coming out when the chisel went in, but that's sort of what it looked like before it oxidized up on the surface. Same stuff is in there. It's just the sulfides, those pyrites, still have their um, sulfur in it. The sulfur hasn't oxidized and gone away and left this rust. Um, makes it a little bit tougher, a little harder to crush and whatnot, but... It's still got the same stuff in it, whether it's rusted or not. We'll take an up-close look here at the vein we're working on. This is the north vein. And we've just taken a sample out of this area and a little bit up, up top here. 
But this is a really weathered, oxidized outcrop. And originally, it was full of sulfides, probably a lot of iron sulfides in the form of maybe puritite or pyrite. There may be some galena in here as well, which is a lead sulfide. But because it's been exposed to the elements for so long, the water, the air, it's all oxidized and it's all turned into oxide. So that sulfur atom that was bound to the metal has been swapped and replaced by an oxygen atom. And that's why it's turned into this spongy, rotten, soft stuff because it's all been oxidized. Now, if you were to mine down in here several feet or maybe tens of feet, it would turn, it would, it would become sulfides again because they haven't been exposed to the air. And you can see a good example of this up here where there's a little vein here within the vein of this black, really dark black stuff. And Dan and I were talking about this earlier and our experience has been this really, really black oxide is uh, from the original material was pyrotite, which is an iron sulfide. And so you can see very clearly how it's all been oxidized, all been rusted out. And uh, it's a good indicator that that's where the gold is because gold often hangs out with iron. Gold rides an iron horse. And uh, so the gold and iron typically stick together. So when you find iron, just like when panning, black sands don't always mean gold, but usually when you find gold, there will be black sands along with it. Now Dan's working on a sample here from the other side of the vein. And it's not quite as defined as the west side. This side looks a little more gradational. Where the, the, the vein and the hanging wall kind of grade into each other. Which isn't uncommon, but it's harder when you're mining and sampling to define the hanging and foot wall. And I gave Dan the harder side, it looks like. <laughs> tough, tough rock, that's for sure. <laughs> Great pyrites in here. Oh, good. Yeah. And it looks like it might be a little wider as well, huh? Yeah. And we're using just a hammer drill to excavate this stuff out. They work really good. It sure beats a hammer and chisel, I'll tell you that. Let's see if we can get up and see what he's doing here. Oh yeah, good stuff. Here, let me just pluck this one out so we can take a look. Good looking piece. And I can get another bag if you we want. That. Oh yeah, that's very dense. Lots of good metal in there. You can even see. Good metal, let's hope it's the gold metal. That's right, the, yeah, we want the good stuff. A lot of metallic sulfides in there. Very nice stuff. Yeah, I'll go get another bag and we can uh, get. I don't know, I think. You got it? I think one bag is good, we what? got the other side. Okay. Maybe a little bit more. But... We're kind of on the other side now. Yeah. Oh, good stuff. That was you, that you did a great job of taking it all the way across, and and you you got about the same amount all the way across. That's the that's a textbook sampling vein there. A little bit less there, just because it was really hard. It was really hard, yeah. <laughs> but it's almost so it's it's not quite a meter there, but maybe close, huh? It's it's we're we're two and a half feet at least. Yeah. Look at us using each other's measurement system. <laughs> All you use metric, you use imperial, and yeah, we'll confuse everybody. But yeah, looking across there, that that one was was only about a foot or maybe sixteen inches, whereas this you've got a significant greater width. Ooh, kind of run into a hard spot in the vein here. It's really hard to get stuff off. Well, we might get a sledge and try and knock some of these bigger chunks off because they're they're just tough stuff.
the hard. Hard like this, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're down through all the oxidized stuff and now it's now it's down to the hard stuff. Now we've resorted to hand tools. Hand chiseling. What do you got? Well, you can see some sulfides there, but you see the quartz above it. Yeah. That is, you know, stereotypical gold ore right there. That's right. Quartz, sulfides, and gold. Yeah. It's think bouncing. It's thinking about it, yeah. It's thinking. It's trying. Oh, yeah. There you go. A couple Stop more. Working. I'm of no help whatsoever right now. <laughs> Cheerleader. Yeah. Yay! Ah. It's heavy. Oh yeah, let's see, there's the, some of the banding. That's yeah. the stuff. That's the stuff dreams are made of. Yeah, yeah, look at there, you got some, got some here. I remember looking, that might be molly. We're talking about molybdenum. Right there, because we were thinking that the galena would be more cubic, whereas this is kind of purpley platey stuff. So that might be an interesting thing to look for, and that'll come across on the shaker table. So we'll we'll be able to capture that. You'll see a line of molly, yeah, yeah, yep. If it's if it's in there, whatever it is, it's certainly dense enough. And I'm not sure what it smells like either. I don't know either. You might have a, a molybdenum button with a little bit of gold in it. Yeah. Oh, I need new chisels. <laughs> well, Dan, what are your kind of initial thoughts here after we've taken some material out of the vein? We've got kind of a good look at some of the fresh surfaces. What do you think? It's a great looking vein. As far as I know what gold ore looks like, this is like stereotypical of what it should look like. So I'm excited. Definitely excited to see what it actually has in it. Yeah. Is this the one of the bigger samples you've taken off the property? Oh, absolutely. Okay. By, you know, a thousandfold. Okay. Okay. So this is this is kind of the first time you've really got to look at what you got here. And uh, this sample is really going to tell you a lot of information. Yeah. The only real sampling I've done here is I took some, you know, debris like this and panned it out, found some gold flakes in it, and a couple of rocks that I took home and cut on the saw just to see what the ore looked like inside. Nothing more really than that here. Okay. So this will be, this will, this will really give you a lot of good information. Absolutely. Good. Jason just broke off a chunk that is just straight molly, straight molybdenum, molybdenum sulfide, molybdenite. Look at that. It came off of this, this little section right here. And let's see if I can just give this. Oh boy. What do we got here? Look at that. It's just a streak. Beauty. All the way through it. Nice. Very, very interesting. Huh. This one may have to go for the auctions as well. <laughs> We've got our samples down here in the bags. So we're finished in this pit. But I noticed that it looks like they kind of cleared off a bench here going out to the east. So they were chasing something here. I was asking Dan why they stopped if this was such a rich spot and they paid off their debt with the smelter, I wonder why they stopped. And he didn't know, he didn't have a, an answer for me, but uh, it may have been a situation where they just got themselves out of debt, maybe the partnership fell apart. But just because you have a hole like this, doesn't mean that there's no gold in it. So we'll get these samples processed and see what they have in them. Here's my fashion of the day. I've got my pants tucked into my socks, because apparently there's quite a bit of ticks out here and Dan says this is a good way to keep ticks off your legs, crawling up your pant legs. So it may not look cool, but I'd much rather have my pants tucked into my socks than a bunch of ticks on me. Well, to get you oriented a little bit here, there's the portal. And they cut back in here to probably expose the veins originally. But I wanted to show you this stuff over here. This is looks kind of like a intermediate intrusive rock. Here's some of it down here. And this is probably what brought up the metals into these vein systems around that Dan's got. But a lot of times you'll have these intrusive rocks that come up like a big bubble through the crust. 
And as they cool, they shoot off all sorts of highly concentrated metallic fluids into the cracks and the faults around. And that's how you get these, these veins popping out like the two we see here. Those fluids come in, they penetrate the cracks, cool, solidify, the metals come out of solution, and then you have these mineable veins. But oftentimes these intrusives are a good indicator that there could be some, some interesting metals around to see. Well, Dan, you think we should go in? I, I think so. What the, um, we got to cut our way in, it looks like, huh? Cut our way in, and then we'll have to close it up afterwards so other people don't go exploring. It is dangerous inside. There is a pit that goes straight down at, at one point. We'll have to watch for that. Yeah. And just to clarify, this is your mine. We're not breaking into anything. Not this is any rules. I own this mine. I am allowed to go inside. We have to do things safely, and we have to make sure that it's safe for others afterwards. But this is all up and up. Okay. Let's go in and see what we can find. Are you excited to see what's inside? I am. It's like breaking into your own house. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do that once too. That felt really wrong. Yeah. Well, hopefully we find something good inside here. I have one more bag too. If we, if we find a exposed vein, we could uh, take one more sample. Okay, there we're going. Go, Jason. Dan's making me go first. It was nice knowing you. <laughs> Look out for the pack rats, he says. Oh boy. Look at all this. Oh, that's a huge pack rat nest. Well, actually, this only goes back to the pack rat nest. Oh, really? Yeah, there's there's the end right there. Okay, so the first level does not go far before it goes down. Yeah, and you can see the little rays they put in there. Yeah, it goes down, down, down. This is a pack rat nest. <laughs> <laughs> it is a big one. <laughs> so you're saying don't jump across there and go look, I don't look, think huh? I would want to walk on yeah. that because you're going to really piss off a really big rat. <laughs> okay. So yes. no, no reason to look down the hole, but... Look at all the mineralization here on the left. Yeah, it's gone yellow. The sulfides have rusted. Well, it's not the sulfur going yellow. It's still rust, you see, but cool. Yeah, so they went, they either went down or they came up. And they must have been chasing something they liked. Because going down or up is a lot harder than going straight in. But yeah, it, they yeah. exposed it all the way along the, the left rib here. Okay, let's get out of here before we wake this pack rat up, huh? I'm kind of tempted to look down. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> My camera's ran out of battery, though. Oh, has it? Yeah. Are you brave enough? Ah, uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> There's rocks right there, so it's not a hollow. Okay. Let's see if I can... Step on the nest. Oh, there's a, there's a rat right there. You found one? Yeah, he's sitting on the stall right down there. <laughs> Holy cow, he is, he's, he's like a, he's huge. <laughs> he's almost perfectly round. I wish my camera was running just to get that on the camera. Oh. <laughs> he's huge. He's huge. He's huge. He's got a big fluffy tail too. Yep, that's a pack rat for you. Big ears? Uh, yeah, little ears. Oh, okay, the one I, one I saw had huge ears. Oh, yeah. But yeah, it goes down there, I don't know, maybe 20 feet, 25 feet, and then it looks like it hits another level and keeps going straight out. That'd be level, level two. Level two. All right, I'll let you, I'll let you come look at this pack rat here. <laughs> Wildlife sighting. Where's the rat? Where's the rat? Oh, there he is. Oh, he's just a little guy. <laughs> That's a little one, huh? <laughs> just a little mini. So we're down at the, kind of the lower workings of the property we were earlier we we're up here in this pit the highest exposure on the property and now we've come down this is the old portal where they did an extensive amount of work it sounds like back in the day and dan's showing me around this is some of the ore that they took out at the very end but it's just kind of solid banded sulfides and this is, looks like quartz here maybe yeah but some of this stuff here you were saying some of this is, is just real heavy, dense yeah, sulfide we, stuff. We broke some of it open and it was just glittery inside, just straight pyrates inside. 
I yeah. Mean, it feels like it might be. It's just heavy. Yeah, yeah, real dense. Real heavy stuff. Yeah. But this was their this was their last little gasp of stuff we're thinking that they pulled out. Got over here, this looks kind of banded. I don't know, maybe. But yeah, there's there's lots of different piles down here. There's a huge dump pile here. It's probably hard to tell on the camera. But there was a significant amount of material that was taken out from underground. And I think most of it came out of that portal. Some of the pyrites and oh yeah, galena or whatever it might be in this. This is from the the tin over there. Yeah, picked up off the tin. Oh yeah, it's kind of like a quartzite or something like that. It looks yeah, yeah, it looks harder than what we were dealing with up top. So Dan, we've been talking. It sounds like you're the quintessential prospector. Yes, you, you are interested in. Not necessarily mining this property, but what is your long-term plans? Well, yeah, I'm a prospector. I find the land, and then I find someone that wants to actually mine it. In this case, we got the the big the local company that's quite interested in this land. So we're going to do a an agreement, an option agreement here, so that they can come in and do some big testing and maybe mine it in the future. But I like finding the land. That's that's what I do. That is what a prospector does: it finds deposits and then let someone else mine it. Yeah. So you're never going to have a drill in your hand going in drilling and blasting. You're you're prospecting. I'm prospecting. I do mine the ocean picture stone, which is just over the hill. But <gasps> right for gold, no. Nope. I'd rather someone else, someone with more experience, more you know resources, did the actual mining here of gold. Well, good. Well, I really appreciate you bringing me out to the property here. This has been so much fun working with you, getting a sample. We'll take her back to my place, and in a future video, we'll see what you got. Awesome. Here's those samples we took. We have three different samples, actually. We have uh, the upper pit south vein. This is the upper pit north vein. And then we have a sample we took off a little quartz vein. So we're going to run those three separately, but I'm going to wait till Dan gets here to crack these open so we can start. We're going to be running through three different types of equipment today, and this is kind of the very basic stuff you need to run ore samples and get some results. This is a jaw crusher, so this will take the raw feed from the sacks. It'll crush it down to about half inch minus. We're going to catch it in this black mason tub, put it in these buckets, and then we're going to run it up through the 16 by 12 hammer mill here up at the top of these stairs. You'll see me dumping the buckets in here into the, the inlet hopper. It's going to go down through the hammer mill. There's a bunch of hammers in here that swing around and beat up the ore crush it up. There's a screen in the bottom half that's about a 0.8 millimeter laser cut slot. And so once the ore gets fine enough to fall through that slot, the water that we inject into the hammer mill will create a nice slurry. It'll come down here onto the shaker table into this distributor trough. It'll evenly distribute the crushed slurry out onto the shaker table. All the dense minerals, the galena, the gold, the silver, uh, pyrite is going to fall down into these grooves and work its way across the table that way. Any of the gang minerals like the quartz or the calcite or anything like that that doesn't have any value is going to flow down here into the number four tailings trough. The sulfides and any other values are going to work their way across the table here. And the table has a little bit of a ramp. It starts right about here. It angles up to a, right at the very tip of these four long grooves and then flattens off again. There's a little plateau there. And what happens is the sulfides get down to these grooves, work their way across the table, but as soon as they come out of the end of that groove onto that uh, little ramp, it can't go any farther. And so it cascades down into the uh, sequential riffles. Then what happens is the gold and only the very densest material can work up these four long grooves onto the cleaning plane. The gold and any of the other dense minerals come up under the water bar, and the water from the water bar washes anything lighter out and away from the cleaning plane. The gold will make a really nice line right down here under the water bar and come down into the number one and number two concentrates here. Most of the gold will end up in the number one. About 5% ends up in the number two. 
There's two safety grooves here, and that's where most of the sulfides will work their way down in a fan at the tip of all these riffles, and they'll get caught in these safety grooves, work down into the number two. And then we have the number three middlings here, which if there's a bunch of sulfides like I think Dan's ore has, it will work their way down the table, down into the number three is the number three middling. This product you can reprocess through the hammer mill, you can save for later, but the number one and the number two are the two uh, concentrate buckets we're gonna focus on today. All right, everyone, Dan Hurd has arrived. We're here, we're gonna go through his samples and crush them through with the equipment behind us and then smelt them down and hopefully get some gold. Dan, what do you think? I'm looking forward to it. I don't know what we're gonna find in these samples, but whatever we find, I'm gonna be excited about it. That's right. Okay, I'm looking forward to it as well. I'm excited. We've been waiting a couple months to do this. Let's get started. We're gonna start with the quartz vein one because it's the cleanest, so it won't contaminate with some of the sulfides the other ones have. So we'll run that one first. Here's our next sample. This is the north vein, the uphill side. And this has a lot more sulfides in it. It's much more oxidized. So we're gonna get this run. And if you wanna see a really nice video on where this stuff came from, check out Dan's channel. He did a really good video where I went up to Canada and we collected all these samples so we could run it through our equipment. So check his channel, Dan Heard Prospecting. And uh, he's got a lot of cool stuff on there. A lot of gem stuff, a lot of rock stuff, plaster stuff. You bet. Yeah, so check that out, but we'll get these run and see what we can find. This is the tail end of the run from the north vein. And all this up here, and that whole band right there is all sulfides that are going down the number one, the number two, and the number three concentrates. So Dan had a lot of sulfides in this stuff. And he's thinking there's gonna be even more in the last sample we run. the hammer mill winding down but this is a little splitter and you can adjust where the cut between the middlings and the tailings are by adjusting that splitter along the trough and ideally if you're running in production you try and keep the table as consistently fed as possible and that way that way the line of the sulfides or the line of the sulfides in the gold never changes so you're not having to adjust the splitter adjust the the water at all, you can just get it set to where you want it, and then as long as that feed is consistent and the ore doesn't change, the table will produce the same results continuously. So most of these rocks coming through here right now are solid sulfides. Any rock you grab is just a solid mass. More water helps separate this more, or the fact that it's just all sulfides, it doesn't really matter. We're... Yeah, it's just, they're so dense that it's hard to push them where you want them to go. Yeah. Just turned off the table for a quick second, just to get a good shot of that line of blue. And I definitely see specks of yellow all through it too. Gold. 
Well, Dan, we've run all three of the samples. What do you think? It went so much smoother than I was expecting. You know, this is so much quicker and easier than what I had set up at my place as sort of like an old turnkey, you know, operation. You throw it at the top, comes out the bottom. I was fighting that constantly. There were no hiccups with this system at all. It all ran so perfect. And I love the fact that I got to see some free meal gold coming from this mine. Awesome. Yeah, yeah no, I think it went great. I'm excited to see what we can get with the, the smelting process. Absolutely. All right, now we're back kind of in the laboratory. We're going to take Dan's samples. We're going to smelt them down. I'm going to add some lead to them and collect the lead button after the smelting process. We're going to put them in these little uh, cupels, and then we're going to put them in our furnace, fire that lead off, oxidize it. It's going to be absorbed by the cupel, and we'll be left with our precious metal button. And then here in a little bit, we'll go over kind of the smelting recipe I use. We'll, I'll show you how to mix up some flux and uh, why I use each ingredient and how it works. Right, this is the quartz number one concentrates in there now. It's coming up to temperature. I don't know if you can see those little shiny dots in there. That's the lead reducing. We'll let that go till it stops bubbling and then we'll pour it. Here's a look at Dan's gold bead from our first sample. This is from the quartz vein. And he didn't think there was going to be hardly anything in there. There's actually a nice little gold bead there. So we'll let that get cooled down and we'll get a weight on it. But our next project is this big pour from the north vein. All right guys, well, let's go over a quick little recipe about what we're going to use for our flux. Here's the number one concentrates off the north vein. So we're going to smelt those next. And I'm going to mix up a flux recipe with the whole goal of getting rid of all these sulfides and having a lead prill at the bottom and uh, just slag on top. We don't want to get any matte phase and that's real common with these sulfides. Okay, so we'll add our 500 grams of number one cons. Now what I found works best for me is about a two to one ratio of sulfide concentrates off the shaker table to the flux that I'm gonna mix up. And for my flux, because I want to get rid of all those sulfides, I'm going to mix about 75% soda ash and 25% silica. That's all I use. I don't use any borax. So because we have 500 grams of number one concentrates, I'm going to shoot for 750 grams of soda ash. Here's 250 grams of silica sand. I'm going to put that in there. Now I'm going to add about 150 grams of litharge. This is lead oxide. And we're going to use this, we're going to reduce it down to lead, and it's going to act as the collector metal for all our gold and silver. Now I'm going to mix this up really, really good. Okay, here's our flux all mixed up. I'm going to add it to a number 12 crucible here. I think it'll all fit. Yep, there we go. About half, half full. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some iron to it, some iron nails. What that iron is going to do is it's going to take all the base metal sulfides like galena, chalcopyrite, anything with copper, lead, moly, and it's going to reduce all those metals down to the metallic form. It's going to trade out the atom of, le of lead or the atom of copper for an atom of iron. That comes from the nails I'm going to add. That reduces all those base metals down to the bottom. It also is going to work on that litharge I added, and it's going to reduce the litharge down to lead. And all that stuff is going to help collect our gold and silver and bring it right down to the bottom of this crucible. The other thing it's going to do is it's going to flood the system with iron. And so when you have all that iron and all the, the sulfur, when you overwhelm it, you have an atom of iron and an atom of sulfur. That FES mineral is one of the few sulfides that we can dissolve in a basic slag. That's why I added so much soda ash.
All right, here's our pour after it cooled down. There should be a little lead prill right here in the bottom. There you go. That's your lead where all the gold and silver are. So now we'll take that, we'll put it in the electric furnace in a cupel. Looks like this. We'll put it in there like that. Get it hot, about 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. All the lead will oxidize and get absorbed into this cupel and it will leave a little button of precious metals down at the very bottom. This is the final cool down on our last sample of the day. Hopefully the best sample. Those little slag cells are gonna cool all the way to solid here in just a second. And all the lead went down to the very bottom of that cone. So when we get that cooled down and knock it out of there, that lead prill, be right at the top of the pyramid. Well, here's our gross mess that we made. And it we were all excited because it was real fluid, real uh, nice looking slag. When we poured it, it started bubbling up this molten stuff. And we're thinking it might be lead that bubbled up through the slag. But we've cooled it down enough now where I hope the lead isn't molten. Let's tip it over and see what we get. Yep, lead right up through it. it pushed up the edges. Oh, oh yeah, still, still liquid. Still liquid. Still a little warm. Okay, we'll wait. Just warm at this level, though. Yeah. It's only melting right there. Yeah. But yeah, look at that. It looks like there's lead pushed up all around it. I've never seen that before. Dan and I will both try and film the surface of the sun here at the same time. If I use you as a shadow. There we go. How's that? <laughs> that looks good. That is what it's supposed to look like right there. I also think I saw, as I was pouring it, a little stream of metal go in right at the end. Right. So I think we recovered quite a bit more lead. Okay, we're just finishing up here. We got all three beads here. Right there is the bead from the quartz vein. Here's the bead from the north vein. And there's the bigger bead from the south vein. We'll get those all weighed up here and see how much precious metals Dan has. And the little, little guy is 0 0.032 grams. Time to do some math. And sample number two comes out to 0.492. Half a gram from sample two. And bead number three comes out to 1.23 grams. So definitely much bigger, but we can tell from its color it's a much higher silver content. Again, I'll do the math here on the screen for you. And here are the final beads. The one on the right from the quartz vein, the one in the center from the north vein, and the one on the left from the south vein, which had quite a bit more sulfides in it. All right, Dan, what do you think? I think we got gold <laughs> and silver and a lot of it. I am very happy with those results. Uh, I can't do the math in my head right now. I gotta go back into a, the calculations, but that's looking pretty darn good. And I know that I can sort of separate off the gold and silver just through the assay reports from the old mine, and we can figure that out for sure. But very happy, love what we got there. Yeah, well this is kind of the final conclusion of our, I came up to BC to see you, you came down to US to see me. Equipment ran good, we got our samples done. And uh, yeah, I'm really happy. 
So am I. And thank you so much for the use of your equipment. Your equipment is fantastic. Cool. Well, thanks. And I'm glad you had a chance to come down. Um, and for those of you watching my video, I was a little bit limited on the amount of video I could take while processing. So be sure to check out Dan's video on this whole process for a little more detail and probably some better shots of the equipment running. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you on the next video.